Hello, Trevor. Hello, how are you? Oh, hundred percent. And you? Oh, I'm good. I just looked out the window. It's snowing. Yeah, I know. I think it's been snowing off and on all day today. Is it? Oh, it's the first time I've noticed. Yeah. First time I've noticed. So how's your day been? Good. Good. How's, how's your courses coming along? Oh, not bad. All the midterms yeah. over now for you guys? Yeah, I do believe. Hello, Jessica. Hello. You see the snow falling outside? I love it. I do too, but I'm I'm surprised. I didn't think we we're supposed to get any snow today. No, me either. My wife is gonna be so excited. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying, oh hello, Jordan. Um, um, you guys got all of your exams done now, and uh, so I suppose most of them are back to you. We'll run run up to to uh, finals now, my you, This is week eight. Believe it or not, this is week eight. It is so quickly how fast the time goes by. Just seeing if anyone else is going to join us. Dum 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 dum. I get to look at the people. So we got Trevor, Jessica, Jordan, and I'm looking to see if Dawson and the. The the uh, the Ivany girls there somewhere somewhere along the line I'm sure they're there somewhere. New oil discoveries announced today, which is good. Um, so I'm glad to hear some positive news. Town just got a bunch of money in terms of COVID funding, so that's good. Never an ill wind doesn't blow on some good somewhere along the line. So I got a meeting right after this, actually, up in the fire hall. That's where we meet now, the new fire hall. And uh, we're going to have some discussions around how to allocate that. Okay. Anyway, uh, we are where we are today. Um, right now, uh, this particular unit is... Um, a shift in this textbook, as I say, uh, I just do a little summary from yesterday, just in case you weren't here. This this particular unit marks a shift in the course. This stage and onward, we're looking at it from the point of view of the supplier, okay? Up to now, we've looked at it from the point of view of the buyer. So someone's coming out and demanding a product. So the demand side of that, that, uh, that curve. What we're looking at now are supply side. So we're looking at First, we're going to look at the short run and how companies uh, manage the short run. And then we'll look at the longer run, how they make decisions in the long run. And then we're going to look at the various types of economies that's out there and how they deal with these production uh, decision-making issues uh, from a monopoly economy to a, a, a purely competitive economy to some sort of a mixed economy. So that's, that's where we're going in terms of the big picture. As of right now, though, what we're looking at is this idea of the short run. And what we mean by the short run is a period of time, usually around a year, usually around a year, where the factors of production, land, labor, capital, and enterprise, or entrepreneurship, depending on what you want to call it, uh, are relatively fixed. It's very hard to change things quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up our slide set here. And our slide set here. Here we go. Okay. So uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, the short run, we're talking about these short periods of time where those factors of production can't really change too much. And what we're going to do is actually change one in order to get the effects uh, on, on uh, the system, okay? And the one we're going to change is really labor, because labor is the one that's most easily changed. So um, if we think about 
you know, short run, you ask yourself, well, this is very theoretical, Paul. I, I don't really understand how this relates to business in the world. Well, if we look at the short run right now in this day and age, the COVID crisis has really thrown a wrench into many companies. And no greater companies have been damaged or affected by this than the airlines. And in Canada, there are two national airlines, it's Air Canada and WestJet. Both are in the exact same situation. I've just picked Air Canada here now. Air Canada has a fleet of over 200 airplanes and 33,000 employees. And these people do everything from sit in the plane to sit in the airport to do the various tasks that are required in order to allow you to fly somewhere. As of right now, the fleet, the Air Canada fleet, 90% of them are grounded. That means that one in 10 of their planes is flying. The others are out in, in a desert somewhere, probably out in uh, around Arizona, where it's nice and dry and nothing rusts. Uh, as an airline, Air Canada is really in a, a fix because they're not making any revenue right now. The revenue situation has gone battle, belly up. And that's the same with, same with every other airline. So here they got 33,000 employees, 200 and change planes that they got to pay for. So they're bleeding $22 million a day is what they're doing. They're bleeding $22 million a day. So the short run for Air Canada is very bleak. You know, they're really in trouble. And over the course of the summer, the president of Air Canada has been on talking about this many times on the business news. And what can they do? Well, the federal government has stepped in and helped Canadian Airlines by actually paying for their employees. So if you work for Air Canada right now, your check, it is coming from Air Canada, but the money is coming from you and me, the taxpayer, in order to keep the airline going. Now, you know, if you think about Air Canada, what can they do in a really short time? Well, they can lay off employees, and they've done that. You know, a lot of employees have been laid off. That's a terrible shock to the system, terrible shock to those employees. It's hard to sell 90% of your fleet, though, if you've got all these planes that you got to pay for. It's really hard to get rid of them. Capital doesn't move as quickly, and especially seeing that there's no one buying airplanes because every airline is in the identical situation. So they're limited in terms of what they can do for their capital change. They can't change quickly in terms of capital. They're having difficulty changing quickly in terms of labor. Other things, like, for example, if we, if we think about uh, the other particular issues, their management staff, which would be considered the enterprise, are working very hard and have been very hard trying to keep everything together. And they're lucky they got a good, strong management staff. So that that is important to be able to do that. And if we think about their land, well, there's not a lot of land that comes into the component there of natural process. Of products that they own. They don't own any anything that occurs naturally. Most of the things that they own are capital oriented. So it's a very, very capital intensive business. And it's very hard to keep all that going in such a situation when it's very difficult to reduce the amount of capital quickly. So what do companies try to do under normal times? Okay, okay under normal times, they're always trying to adjust their short run so they maximize their profit. If they're profit-seeking firms, their goal is to maximize their profit. So everything they do in the short run in terms of their land, labor, capital, and enterprise is geared at producing products and services out there at the lowest possible, pr the lowest possible price to create the maximum possible revenue, i.e. profitability. And companies are always doing cost analysis. And one of the things that, that we could say is they need to get their costs down. Now, if you take it to its logical extreme, what do you have to do in order to get your costs as close to zero as possible? If you think about it, shutting down your business gets your costs as close to zero as possible, right? Is that practical? No. It's not practical to shut down a business to save a business. So what companies need to do is to operate at their lowest 
possible average cost. They want to get their average cost of making production. Now, that's a term we haven't heard before, so we're going to learn about average cost in here. <clears throat> if we, uh, a there is a little summary in the textbook that talks about different types of firms that's out there. Every single firm faces the same challenge with regards to getting their cost down to the lowest possible level. And if we think about the various types, there's sole proprietorship, the partnership, the corporation, the not-for-profit organization. Those are ones that we should be familiar with. We looked at it last year in law. And if you think about other types of corporations that kind of fall in, a state-owned corporation could be a partnership corporation or anything else, but unique type of corporation in that it is owned by the government. Air Canada used to be a state-owned enterprise. It used to be. It's not anymore. It's been sold off. If you wonder what a state-owned enterprise, in Canada we call them crown corporations, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is an example of a crown corporation. Newfoundland my Labrador Housing is an example of a crown corporation. College of North Atlantic is an example of a crown corporation. What do those organizations do? You'll notice that neither one of them are really geared to make profit. They're geared to be able to, to provide a service to people. In the case of the CBC, it's over 75 years old. The CBC was invented and a creation of government to allow Canadians to communicate, to keep the country together. Okay, so it was designed as a communication tool. It's evolved over the years. If you look at Air Canada, Air Canada, when it was started as TransCanada Airlines back almost 70 odd years ago, uh, Air Canada was designed to allow the country to keep together, allow people to connect to different parts of the country. So Gander, for example, was the largest airport in the world at that point in time, and it played an instrumental role in the growth of companies like Air Canada. Regardless of what the company is, they all have to get their costs down. And how do they do that? Well, first of all, they got to understand this basic concept of the production process. And I think you've all seen this before. We have inputs that go into making whatever we make. And here are the example in your textbook. They give you the example of a, a cement plant. Okay, if you think about a cement plant, what are the things that go into it? Sand, gravel, cement, water, machines, labor. All that gets put into this magic box called the production process. Sometimes the magic box is a factory. Sometimes it's an oil refinery. Sometimes it's a quarry. It doesn't really matter what it is. It is the process that takes all of those inputs and changes them somehow to generate output. So in the case of a cement plant, Sand, gravel, and cement, and water are all put in, mixed in giant mixers, and out comes concrete, which can be delivered to make sidewalks, basements, and everything else. So that production process is the critical part. We need to worry about how can we get costs down in our production process. There's really two kinds of costs that we talk about in, in economics. Unlike accounting, Accounting only focus on one type of cost, and that type of cost is an explicit cost. And if you look at the little graphic there, I got table 6-1, you will see explicit costs as the revenue and expense statement for a company. So the company had, in this case, $20,000 worth of revenue, and out of that, there are the expenses. So we got rent, materials, utilities, labor, and depreciation. And you can see that that comes to $17,200. So the accounting profit for that business is $2,800. That's accounting. You're, you've been drilled on that. You should be understanding how that came about. Economists, however, say, oh, that's not good enough. We just can't think about costs that are what we find in the balance sheet and the income statement. We need to think about the cost of opportunities lost because we did something, okay? So really it's opportunity cost. We've talked about this before. And if you, for example, are running this business and this is your business and you look at it and you say, well, I made an accounting profit of $2,800. That's pretty good. So in a week's activity or a month's activity, $2,800 accounting profit, decent. But because you spent time, effort, and energy in that business, doing whatever you did in order to make that business work, you could not do something else. 
So let's say, for example, you're in that business and you're making $20,000 a year in that business. You're pulling $20,000 a year out of that business. Now, the company is making a profit because you're only pulling a very small salary out of it. Had you gone to work for someone else, you could make $40,000 a year or $60,000 a year or $100,000 a year. So because you're working for yourself, you're missing or foregoing that opportunity to make that money, that extra money. That difference between what you could have made and what you are making is really what we call your implicit cost. It's the cost of your next best alternative or the cost that are incurred because you're missing that next best alternative. So in the case of this particular example, the opportunity costs of $96,000 put into the business. So you put $96,000 in order to start this business. You could have put that $96,000 in the bank and earned interest on it and got $800 interest. You didn't because you put it in your business. So you lost that $800 worth of interest. That's what's called an implicit cost. You could have made an extra $4,000 that month if you worked for someone else. You didn't. So you lost that. So if we think about the implicit costs here, implicit costs are costs that are not necessarily obvious nor counted in the income statement, but they are certainly costs that affect you as an individual. So in this business, for example, if you were to consider your implicit costs, you actually lost $2,000 in the month. Had you done something else, you could have made $2,000 more than what you made. <coughs> so when we think of business, business has to consider, from an economics point of view, business has to consider its implicit costs whenever it makes decisions. I used the example yesterday when I described this about the oil companies. You know, off Newfoundland, for example, we ask ourselves, those darn oil companies are going away or not investing in here. What's the matter with them? You know, we hear that politicians talking about it. We hear the general public talking about it all the time. But the oil companies are in the business of making money. They're not in the business of helping Newfoundland out or Tahiti out or Saudi Arabia out. They are interested in making money. They're going to go to the parts of the world, because they're international companies, that will allow them to make the most possible return on their investment. So if the cost of doing business here in Newfoundland because of implicit costs is higher, implicit costs are what they forego. You know, they could have saved a bunch of money, for example, by drilling in Saudi Arabia because you don't have to have a big production platform in Saudi Arabia. You just stick a hole down through the desert and out comes the money. You know, um, they need to make enough money in, in Newfoundland to compensate for the fact they had to build this giant oil rig in order to go off the coast of Newfoundland. And if they're not making enough money to cover that, so that you can say, well, they're making money in Saudi Arabia, they're making money here too. Why do they need to make more money in Newfoundland? They need to make more money in Newfoundland because they have higher implicit costs here in Newfoundland. And as a result, they need to make the best possible return on their investment across the world, let alone here in Newfoundland. So they need to make more profit here. We see this example uh, in a, you know, a, a simple little diagram here. If you were to think about a, a normal company using a normal accountant's view, the right-hand column there, you'll see that there's costs and there's revenue. The revenue is the total size of the stock. Uh, the two of them combined, to get, uh, the both stacked on top of one another. That's an accountant's view of the total money. So uh, in this case, 17.2 plus 7,800 is uh, $25,000, okay? There's $25,000 in revenue here. There's expenses of 17.2, so the profit is 7,800. Simple, simple, complete math. The one on the left, though, looks at the economist view. And again, the, pro uh, the, the revenue is the same, $25,000. And the explicit costs, as per the balance sheet, as per the income statement, is still 72. But the question is, we had, in, we had extra expenses doing this business. We could have gone and run a business somewhere else and had lesser expenses or some other competing environment. In fact, the, those expenses were $4,800. So really, our economic profit was only $3,000 working in our, in our current factory. So we call this, this implicit cost normal profit. In other words, 
uh, the business, as I say, in order to work here, like the oil industry, they got to make not only a profit, but they got to cover what they could have made somewhere else. And that's what's called their normal profit. So they need to make more here in order to compensate for being here. Yesterday, we looked at this problem one, and we talked about uh, tuition, uh, cost of board, cost of lodging, and, and these sorts of things as you go to school. And you ask yourself, how much, how much does it cost to go to school? Well, in this particular instance, you'd be gone for two years. So you take 28, 8, and 700, and you add them together, and you'll get uh, about $12,000. Uh, for two years, that's $24,000. So really, it's the school is costing you in terms of raw dollars and cents, uh, twenty four thousand. However, in order to go to school, you got to give up the thousand dollars that you earn now. Uh, Judy is presented with an opportunity, and, and you know she earns a thousand dollars a month now. So if she goes to school, she's going to have to give up that job. So it's going to cost her over the course of two years twenty four thousand dollars in lost wages. So the cost of going to school is twenty four thousand dollars lost plus the exact cost of going to school. So you can see her implicit costs are $24,000. Any questions on that part? Well, let's look at the, the second thing here. And the second thing that we looked at in this particular example really drives at this issue of how do we get the most out of our business to lower our average cost? How do we calculate that? What do, what do we do in order to figure out if our business is making the most possible money or the most possible return for us? Well, all businesses are driven by a concept called productivity. And productivity is a very simple concept. It takes the amount of output, divides it by the amount of input in order to calculate the ratio of output to input, productivity. And the better that ratio is, the more productive a business is. So productivity is commonly defined as ratio between output volume and the volume of inputs. In other words, it measures how efficiently production inputs, such as labor and capital, are being used in an economy to produce a given level of output. This is a, you know, Canada's, we often hear in the news about a productivity problem we have in Canada. And the question is, are we improving our productivity in Canada? You know, it is... We have a certain level of input going in. We have a certain level of output coming out. Are we improving that? Is there more output for a given amount of input coming out as we move along because of technology, education, all these things? Now, Canada is pretty good with regards to productivity. The relative amount of output we get per unit of input is pretty good. But the driver in, in our world is to increase our productivity. How can we keep getting a, a more output for a limited amount of input. And all businesses really focus on this. How do we get more for less? How do we get more for less? And Henry Ford, let's go back to 1914, 19, between 1907 and 1914. Henry Ford was, uh, was really focused on this concept of productivity. And he was building cars, as you're probably aware. And he came up with this car called the Model T. Now, Henry was uh, very much a, uh, an engineer that was uh, what we call an industrial engineer who was very focused on getting the most output for the minimum input. And he struck upon the idea. He said, in the short term, we can really uh, improve our productivity by focusing on labor. Labor is the easiest one to change and the easiest one to improve. So that's what he did. And he came up with this concept called the division of labor. And the division of labor, effectively what it does, it assigns different parts of a manufacturing process or task to different people in order to improve efficiency. So we see this assembly line here of Model T's. What you would find as the car comes along this line, this assembly line, it was a moving assembly line, individuals along that line would put different parts on it. So let's assume that you're assigned to put the front tires on, okay? You get, the theory is, is that you'll get very efficient at putting the front tire on it because that's all you do. You are an expert front tire putter on her. 
On the other side of the fence, over across the uh, across the, uh, the line there, someone else is responsible for putting the seats in. That's all they do. They And the theory is they'll get really good at putting the seats in. So if we can have people put various parts on the car as it goes along the assembly line, what we have to have achieved, number one, is someone has got really good at it because they know what they're doing. The other thing we've achieved, and this is the real, the real kicker from a productivity point of view, is those people don't have to be that bright. Okay? How much training do you need to put a tire on? How much training do you need to put a seat in? It's a very small task. It's not a variety of task. It's a one of. You put the tire on. Here's how you do it. You put it on there and you put a nut on it. That's all you got to do. Simple. So any idiot can learn to do the task. And that was the basis of Ford's genius. We don't need skilled labor, so we don't have to pay them a lot. And we get them to do a singular task that they can really do well or learn to do really well. And the division of labor has really, really been focused on that. And right through until about the 1970s, this was the primary way that we drove our productivity in Canada is getting people to do singular tasks. The problem with that was is that the human factors got involved. People got bored of doing the same job over and over again. So what could we do in order to make it a little more interesting? But from an economics point of view, it worked super. Here's an example of this division of labor being applied to drive productivity, and it's called the theory of production. So it is clear that increased production will involve higher total costs. We know that as we make more, the total cost is going to go up, no question. But the, but the thing is, common sense indicates that more inputs are added in production process, more outputs will be obtained. The thing is, what we're trying to do is get the cost per unit down. Okay, get the cost per unit down. If we look here in this example, we have nine variations in the number of people on the job, okay? So you can imagine that assembly line that I showed you back here, okay? Let's think about how many people we have working on that assembly line from zero right through to eight, okay? So we got zero to eight people. If we don't have anybody working on the assembly line, do you see anyone in the picture? No. So let's assume that we have nobody working on the assembly line. There is no production being produced. Let me just see if I can bring up this little pointer here, okay? If there's no labor, nobody's working, nothing is gonna get produced. Let's assume that it's all labor-based production, okay? So zero units of labor, zero input equates to zero output. Input, output. If we let one person work, one person now starts working on that assembly line. That one person working all day can produce, let's say, four cars or four units of production. So one person working by him or herself can produce four units. Okay? If we add a second person to the assembly line, so we, we put two people on that assembly line, look at what happens to the total production. It goes up to 16. What? That doesn't make a lot of sense. One person can produce four. You would think two persons could produce eight because it would double four per person. But that's not what happens. Because of the theory of production and the division of labor that we've just talked about, the theory goes that those two people can split up the job and help one another and be much more efficient because they'll focus on a specific task and be able to help one another do the task. So I'll hand you the parts, you put the part on. Okay, that sort of thing. So because of this, our productivity goes up by a factor of four when we add two people. Wow. So if you were the manager in that plant, you'd say, yeah, let's make sure we got at least two people. We get a much more productive environment by adding two. Well, let's bring a third person on. The third person comes on and look at this. 
our production goes up to 36. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, again, three people can help one another. They can split up the job. They can, they can work together. One can hold the part while the other one puts the nut on. It, you know, it speeds up the process. They're specialized. All of the, all of the features of division of labor can be applied, and it increases total production. Add four people. Look, production goes up to 60, and that's fantastic. You know, so that means on average, we could say that they're making 15 units each. And again, it's because they're working together. Now, add five people. Look, the productivity goes up even more. The production goes up even more, I should say. Production goes up to 75. Add a sixth person, goes up to 84. Add a seventh person, goes up to 84. Oh, that's the same as it was back there. Add an eighth person, goes to 72. It drops. Why is that? So what we're seeing here is a pattern. We see right up through to 60, productivity increases relative to the worker. So, and we could ask ourselves, well, how much is it increasing? Well, this is where this concept of marginal product comes in. Marginal product asks, how much did each worker contribute? So, obviously, there's nothing produced here, so we don't have anything here. When we bring one person on, we got four more than what we had. So that's a marginal of four. When we bring two people on, we're making 12 more. So marginal is 12. When we bring three people on, it goes from 16 to 36, it went up by 20. We go from 36 to 60, it goes up by 24. We go uh, from 60 to 75, or four to five workers, 60 to 75, goes by 15. 75 to 84, goes up by 9. 84 to 84, 84 to 84, doesn't go anywhere. And when we add that last unit, eight people, it goes down by 12. Marginal productivity will normally follow this pattern. We're seeing increased productivity up to a point. And this point is marked by the, time, the highest marginal product. Here it is, 24. Went up by 24. At that point of four workers producing 60 units, the fifth worker comes in does not contribute as much as the last one did. The last one added 24. This one is only adding 15. It's still going up, but notice that it's not, not as much. As we start moving into this scenario, where we go from six or five to six to seven, well, from five to six, it went up by nine, but from six to seven, look, nothing happened. Well. What do you think could be some of the reasons why this productivity starts to fall apart? Well, let's just look at our picture again. You can imagine the floor space here is so big. And as we bring our workers on, they're going to, they might start bumping into one another. You can see them bumping into one another in this narrow passageway here. Or they can't all fit. So what we're seeing is as labor goes up, inefficiencies start to come into the system. We see efficiency, well, we see efficiency improving, maxing out, and then inefficiencies come into the system. So it got this kind of a um, upside down U, uh, you could think of improving down and the declines. So the question that you would have if you're a manager here is say, well, what would be the most efficient level of production? Well, we know, we know that it's going up, 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 right until we get to five, uh, well, to four workers. We see that there's a big improvement there, and then it starts to decline. So some around four or five workers. If we take the what's called the average product, the average product is simply saying, if we think about the total output and we divide it by the number of workers that were involved in making that total output, we can get what's called the average product. And the average product, you'll see, goes up, 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 maxes out, and starts to decline, just like what happens to marginal. In fact, when marginal starts to decline here, 24 to 15, we see we're at the highest possible point. <clears throat> so if I were to ask you, what is the most efficient, what would you suggest that this company work at 
in terms of the number of workers, in order to maximize this productivity, what would you suggest? How many workers? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Well, you know that you got to have the you want to have your average product that's highest. In other words, the workers are producing on average 15 units each at its highest point. So four or five workers will both give you the highest average product. Now five workers will give you more product. And you'll you'll have 75 units to sell as opposed to 60. So ideally you'd want to have more product to sell. So five workers would be the most ideal in this case. I hope you can see that. So what are the basic advantages that division of labor allows for a company to benefit from in terms of the short run? Well, um, you know, we see that as workers get added, productivity per worker goes up to a point. Adam Smith, the father of modern capitalism, said there are five distinct reasons that we get this productive power that comes from division of labor. First of all, it is there is an enhanced ability to fit the person to the job. You might be a really good tar putter on it. You might not be such a good person to put in seats in. So if you're at the job of tar putter on her, that's the best job for you. I might be better at putting seats in. So we can fit the person to the job. The increased dexterity achieved when the best worker becomes specialized in performing a single operation. I don't know if you've seen people working in plants, fish plants, or any, any tasks that they're really good at, plasters. Once you get really good at it, dexterity just means how fast you can move your hands. Uh, you know, people, uh, uh, my mother, for example, could uh, sort cards. What do you call it? What do you call it when you sort cards? You have to shuffle, shuffle cards really well. So dexterity, you know, you get better at it as you do it more often. The time saved when workers don't have to change tools or switch machines because they are performing a signal task. So let's say, for example, that on that Model T, the nut that holds the tar on is a one-inch crown nut. Well, if you've got a wrench that got a one-inch socket on it, you don't have to change the socket for something else. It's always the same. That's the only wrench that's used. You can do it much more quickly. The time saved that would otherwise be lost moving from one operation to another. You don't want people moving around. So you keep them on the floor, and if they don't have to move around, they're stood up next to the station, they can be much more efficient. The machine specialization can be developed around specific discrete operations. And as I say, you put the proper uh, um, wrench with the proper uh, size, uh, it will allow it to do that job. And finally, I wait for this to appear. When productivity for worker begins to drop, you're experiencing what we call diminishing returns. So this, this stage here where we see this drop is called the point of diminishing returns. The law of diminishing returns, which talks about that, states that more and more units of a variable resource can be added to the production process, but at some point the resulting increase begins to decrease, assuming that at least one other input is fixed. So what we're seeing, for example, is this factory is only so big. As we add more workers into it, they have less space to move. <coughs> so as we add seven or eight people, we're seeing less and less space to do what needs to be done. The reason for decreasing marginal product of labor is simply that factory size will eventually become overcrowded with workers. The too many cooks in the kitchen. kitchen analogy okay <clears throat> so average product will always rise if marginal product exceeds it will fall if marginal product is lower and we see this in the graphic marginal product which is the additional amount is going up right here 
up to this stage, and we see average product going up. As the marginal product begins to fall, we see average product start to fall. Now, I always think about this, instead of a production process, you think about your exam. Let's assume you got three exams in this course. The first exam, you get 100 on it. The second exam, you get a 90. So your average will be drawn down because you got a lower mark on your second exam. It'll drag down the average. If you got the uh, 90 on your first exam and on the second exam you got 100, it's going to bring up your average. This is graphically illustrated on this little production chart. And so we can think about total production. So if we see, for example, here's, here is this data that's right here on this table put into a graph. And so here's our total production. You can see one worker through to eight workers, our total level of production. So total production is up here. And if we plot our marginal productivity, and our average productivity, it'll plot like that. You notice when marginal productivity crosses the average productivity line, average productivity starts to fall. So it's at this point where these cross that average productivity will fall. So in this particular instance, we can draw from this that our maximum total product occurs at the seventh unit. Our maximum marginal product right here we look at our marginal chart occurs at the fourth unit and our maximum average product occurs at the fifth unit so depending on what we're looking at but the maximum average is really what we're focused on for maximizing productivity so the that's that's the one that we look at from a business point of view we want it to be the lowest or the highest marginal average product most product for the amount of input. Okay, so what I got here uh, is a test your understanding, and I just want you to take a couple of minutes here, or five, well, let's lay eight minutes, it's 12 minutes after. I want to take eight minutes for you to look at this, uh, this problem. So give this some thought.
Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping that you've had an opportunity to figure this one out now. So what we got is uh, <coughs> what we got is our units of labor, and our total product, our marginal product, and our average product. And you need to be able to work out the the blanks. So effectively, uh, everything I've yellowed in here is is blank. 
So our total production, uh, we know that the total production is given to us, so 0, 80, 170. Our marginal production, we're looking for that. Our marginal production is just the additional amount that is added. So if we were to go, for example, here, oops, if we were to go from 0 to 80, the marginal production is 80. In other words, it went up by 80. Uh, 80 to 170, it went up by 90 in this case. And if it went up by 90, 170, uh, 170 plus the 80 that was given to us, we could work it back, and that would be 250. And we could do that the same, the same mechanical process we would do right down through. The average product is the easy one to figure out because all we're doing with the average product is taking our total product and dividing it by the units of labor. So for example, uh, we got division by zero, so there's nothing going in there. We had 80 total production with one unit of labor. 80 divided by one is 80. Next case, we had 170 units of total production divided by two. That's 85 per, and so on. We go right down through doing that same. You see the math I've done there. The question was asked in the thing, well, what exactly is the, the highest then? Where are we to? Well, if we look at our marginal total product, it is highest at two units of labor. And if we look at our average production, uh, it is highest at two units of labor as well. In fact, the theory says that as this one starts dropping, this one will start dropping. So if we had to ask yourself, what is the most productive number of workers that we have? What is the, the lowest cost per unit produced? Okay, it's, it's not the maximum production, it's the lowest cost per unit, it would be two units of labor. Okay, that would give us the most productivity for a given amount of input. Any questions on that? So that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of thing that you need to be able to uh, do here is to take a look at those productivity problems and be able to calculate the marginal, the average, okay? And in our next class, we'll look at a couple of more of those as we work through and add on our cost structure next week. Any questions? No, I think I'm good. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go today. Thank you for joining me. We'll see you on Monday. Perfect. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.